My name is Charlie Parker. I'm the president of the Penfield Heritage Association, and I thank you all for coming. Uh, we got a remarkable turnout, and I think this will be a very interesting program. Uh, just from my point of view, uh, we are the Penfield Heritage Association. I'd also like to thank Penfield uh, Public Library for, uh, for giving us a space so we can put on remarkable programs like this. And I'd also like to thank the Penfield Green Initiative, especially Mel Callen and Robin Miller to help put this program together. And at this time, I'll let Mel come up and do a little talk on her group. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, everybody, for coming. We're really delightful to be um, co-sponsoring this with the Penfield Public Library and the Penfield Heritage Association, of which I've been a member for a few years. Um, I, we're such a small group in the Penfield Green Initiative. I'd just like to have my uh, colleagues stand up and uh, give them recognition. Uh, we've been in existence for about since about 2007. And we just started as a small group. Um, thus far, we have remained a small group. However, we have uh, a rather extensive email list. And when you signed up, if you want to uh, be on our email list, we're certainly happy to include you in that. Just a various notices of programs that we do. And, um, and they're, they're sporadic. It depends on um, what's going on at the time. And we thought this was a perfect uh, example of how to uh, work with another group in the community. And uh, we really wanted to highlight these uh, special folks that represent such a, uh, a strong component of our, our town in Penfield, and that's the agriculture component. And so I'm really excited to hear from our farmers and from the town, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Uh, but we, as I said, we were formulated in about 2007, and subsequent to that, we're delighted that the town has formed an energy um, advisory committee. And uh, we're, our, as our brochure says, we are um, we want to promote positive environmental action and provide a forum for the general public to be involved in, in supporting a green penfield. Periodically, we have um, programs. We've had one on uh, wildlife habitat and some. Uh, energy conservation uh, from the gentleman from NYSERDA and uh, wind power. So we, periodically we have uh, programs just to keep ourselves informed and, and learn from others who have experts in various areas. So with that, I'd just like to introduce Sue DeRosa, who's in the back. And if you guys could just stand, Robin Miller. So if you have any questions about Penfield Green Initiative, any one of us can answer. Deb Miritor is in the back. And Georgina Terry's in the back. Thank you very much, and um, look forward to the program. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our panel here uh, that uh, we have right now as uh, Peter Brannan, uh, Dick Hammond, <laughs> Terry Rothfuss, and Marty Shute. Uh, we're going to start this program out with a, about five minutes for each of our uh, panel members here to uh, talk about uh, when their farm was established and uh, where it is including land that you might lease to farm and uh, what uh, do you farm. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. But before I do, I hear they're, they're quite a talkative bunch. So, <laughs> you know, we got to get the bell out here. We're going to make sure that when I ring it, they're going to stop. Or, or, oh, here we go. We're going to get the, we're gonna get the gavel on. <laughs> and I'll bang on that and I'll give them a 30 second warning. So I'll start with you, Marty. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marty Shute. And, uh, a little louder, please. Louder. Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm a farmer. I used to yell at it, uh, horses and animals. And so, anyway, uh, our, our farm is a fruit farm. We started in 1917 and um, we were over on Salt Road before then and I, I don't have much history of that part of the farm but the, I do know that my grandparents um, started the cider mill in 1917 and um, at that time it was a much different operation. It was uh, mostly used where people would bring in their fruits and we would press them anything from apples to grapes and a lot of times uh, their payment would be left as part of the um, as, as part of whatever they brought in say they would want 50 gallons and 25 would stay <coughs> with us so 
It also evolved from there. Um, that was a hard cider, more or less, operation or spirits. And uh, <laughs> they would fill people's barrels and they would go home. And my grandfather always said that uh, you could tell a man's wealth and his friends by the size of his barrel. <laughs> so the bigger the barrel, meant the more popular you were. Um, but it's evolved. And um, as agriculture changes, too, um, we have become a, a sweet cider operation, more of a health food initiative. And uh, from there, my dad recognized that early in the 60s uh, that uh, we could not sustain a, a farm or fruit farm in the town unless we were able to retail and go after um, where we weren't inhibited by processors to stifle our growth. And um, from there, the, the meal, mill evolved into more or less a, a store and um, we tried to retail in 66 we built our own apple storages which were state-of-the-art from Cornell at the time um, they still exist today but uh, there's been many more improvements and because of the improvements in the cost we now store a lot of things down in KM Davies which is a, a, a cooperative in Williamson where we Put apples actually the day we picked them they're put down there and they're put to sleep and uh, about this time of the year we pull them out and it enables us to have a market year round where they're crisp and just like they were picked on the tree now and they keep opening these rooms for the next three four months which enables us to you know sell to the public um, as far as where our farm is am I supposed to go over there and yeah if you would like to <laughs> and show you our farm has changed throughout the years. It's on Plank Road, which we can see up here. It's Shoecraft's on one side and Jackson's on the other. And it consists of three or four plots. We still have a, a 50 acre plot, which um, is all tillable. And uh, we grow 50 acres of apples there. The cider mill is across the street on its own plot. And next to it, um, when uh, a farmer, Jerome Stump, who was a long time Penfield resident puts them up for sale uh, because of its location right next to our cider mill we thought we should purchase that 10 acres to keep any housing or or anything away from our agricultural operation so we have another 10 acres over there plus the mill sits on six so we have about oh pretty close to 70 acres uh, if you added it all up and took in what there was at one time there was hundred and three acres and what had happened was in the 70s, the Nature Conservancy wanted the thousand acre woods. And with that, we gave them or minimally sold it to them for their Nature Conservancy. So our farm was reduced at that point down to about 60 acres. We also had one other sale that went to a housing development and uh, the reason for the sale was not that we wanted to sell but as most of you have had um, parents or grandparents or whatever in a nursing home we sold a section of it to pay for some of my grandmother's care um, with that uh, we managed to keep most of it back up and gain a few more acres um, with the Cornell plantings now they're high density where we used to plant, my grandfather planted 40 by 40, and that was in the row, and he had 25 trees on an acre. Our new planting this year will have 1,000 trees on an acre. They will grow only as tall as 10 feet. The row will be 14 feet wide, and everything will be trellised because the tree bears so many apples, it actually can't support itself, and this is by the rootstocks and the variety have all come full circle and I guess you'd say it's not genetic engineering but it's actually a breeding program so that apples have changed a lot we also want to get so that we don't use ladders liability in today's world and um, all of the uh, things that uh, for picking and quickness and everything is, you know, uh, mechanized now in pellet boxes that um, everything is changing. And I think you'll see this. Uh, we were have to talk a little bit about environmental later. And you'll see that um, our, our sprayers now are anti-drift. Um, everything is 
biodegradable in two or three days. There's no heavy metals in the sprays. It's, it's really, to feed the world, we have to up our production, but we're doing it in a very, very safe manner. And so I really believe that agriculture in the fruit end um, is benefiting from all of these new incentives like buy local, uh, nutrition, obesity. I mean, all of these things I think you're going to see that are kind of number one health issues are fruit and vegetables are going to play into a healthier society. And um, we all say our children all eat at fast food. I think there's a trend to, to change that as much as I'm a product of the fast food. <laughs> um, I don't believe there's anything else. Yes? Can I ask a couple questions? I, I don't We're going to save that for the end. We'll, we'll like to ask questions. Uh, we just want to continue on with the for now. I thought I'd turn it over to Terry Rothfuss. Uh He's been around a lot longer than I have their farm, so uh, you guys all know of it as the park. Uh, yeah, I'm Terry Rothfuss. Um, it, uh, this time our farm is out on Salt Road, about halfway between uh, Atlantic Avenue and Five Mile or Atlantic Avenue and uh, Penfield Road at 441. And um, we've been out there. My dad and uncle and grandfather bought that from the Amons in uh, December of six, 1966. <coughs> and uh, Prior to that, uh, my dad and uncle and grandfather and great-grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather came over and uh, bought the farm on Five Mile Line where Rothfuss Park is now. Um, and uh, <coughs> that's where they got started. And then when my dad and mother got married, uh, uh, my grandfather and uncle and uh, their wives uh, purchased the farm on the corner of uh, Atlantic Avenue and Five Mile Line. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, I don't know just how many acres were on that farm, but uh, that used to be part of it where Shadow Lake is mm -hmm. and um, where the Methodist Church is on Baird Road. Um, that was always a part, that was part of our farm and it was just uh, so rocky and that they never did anything to speak of with other pasture and uh, the Methodist Church wanted to expand and I think that was back in the mid 50s uh, they sold that to the Methodist Church and um, and then uh, in 1967 my grandfather passed away and uh, <clears throat> he didn't have much of a will and they uh, you know, so they, my dad and uncle had to come up with quite a chunk of dough for the inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. So they sold the rest of the farm on the corner of Atlantic Avenue and Five Mile Line, and they had already bought the farm on Salt Road. So, uh, uh, anyways, uh, then in 1970, it, uh, well, my dad and uncle started a dairy store um, on the Five Mile Line farm where the park is, and um, I don't know they. Ran that selling uh, uh, milk and ice cream and uh, bread. Uh, I don't know for probably 20 years, I guess. And then in 1974, my dad and uncle split up, and uh, my dad just took everything that was on Salt Road. And my uncle, he was a little more sentimental, so he wanted to keep the home farm mm -hmm. on Five Mile Line. And uh, so, anyways, <clears throat> we used to milk cows. In 92, we sold our uh, dairy cattle. Um, it just seemed like it took a lot of help, and I'm not a good people manager, so um, <laughs> we, we chose to get rid of the cows. And now we raise uh, hay for a lot of the local horse farms, and uh, you know, about 150 acres of corn. And, 80 acres of soybeans and about 80 acres of wheat. And uh, so, uh, anyways, and like like I say, we're we're just out on uh, Salt Road between uh, uh, Atlantic and 441.
Yeah, which would be right out here. Uh, so, anyways. This is it. Thank you, Jerry. Peter? Peter Brayman, and my family came here in 1825 from Rhode Island and settled on the property, which is still the Brayman Farm at 1411 Sweets Corners Road. It's been in the family for getting close to 200 years. Um, I don't know what their main, when they first came here, what they probably just farmed to survive. I don't know if they had a lot of cash crops in those days, but after the turn of the century, the commission ditch was dug and some of the lower lands, which was swamp land, was drained and turned into muck land for vegetable crops. And uh, my grandfather and great uncle grew a lot of celery, potatoes, carrots, onions, all those kind of perishable muck crops and until about 19, late 50s, early 60s and my dad kind of took over the farm and went more into the dairy operation and that's what I remember most is the dairy farming and uh, he came down with cancer in, 19, in uh, 1999 and passed away and I kept the family dairy cows for about a year and couldn't get adequate help. Mm -hmm. So I decided to disperse those and keep the farms and uh, just raise cash crops and I have some beef cattle. Yeah. And that's what uh, the way it is today. Uh, here's the 1411 Sweet Scorch Road farm right here. And this this property here, and this property was added on about 1980. Then my parents bought that uh, neighboring property on Whalen and Dublin Road. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Richard Hammond, long-winded person. <laughs> if you don't believe it, ask George Weimer. Uh, kind of a pleasure. To, it is a big pleasure to be here. Uh, my, my name is Richard Hammond, of course, and uh, our farm originally was over here from uh, Whalen and Baird Road going east of the cemetery, starting at perhaps, some of you know where the uh, two ponds are, uh, going uh, north and then uh, from Whalen Road east to the first, uh, the old Jackson Road. It's kind of like a square area in there that was a 50 acre farm. Grandfather Hammond bought that in uh, 1905. Uh, they were sharecropping at various places before then and finally was able to uh, secure a loan from, I'm not exactly who the person who held the mortgage, but my dad told me it was uh, $10,500 in 1905. So that was a but it was a tremendous farm, uh, had very little rock, uh, very good drainage, uh, level ground, and uh, close enough to uh, Rochester Public Market, which started in 1905. And uh, my dad told me of stories of uh, taking vegetables and uh, chickens and such to the, to the market. Um, Later on, uh, my mother and father couldn't come to agreement with my grandmother on uh, the farm. So uh, about that time, my mother's father, uh, Blackrope, passed away over on Penfield Center Road. And uh, my dad and mother purchased that farm from the estate. And uh, that's where we are today. Um, we would take stuff over to East Rochester on a Friday night and what was called trading. We had a, a couple of markets over there that purchased our vegetables and uh, also we uh, from time to time would knock on doors. You could do it in them days without permits and everything and uh, mm -hmm. sell our sweet corn and tomatoes and whatever we had uh, at that time and it was a great lesson I thought for myself uh, learned uh, disappointments from knocking on a door and refusal to buy your product and then of course those that 
uh, did like the product and uh, it worked out well. Uh, mother and I would go to the show and uh, after we done our trading and selling and uh, in his roster and uh, my dad would go to adult beverage and play a little euchre and uh, wind out the Saturday evening. <laughs> and uh, so then uh, it came a point where uh, my dad actually had to work for Brown Brothers Nursery instead of relying on the farm on Pepco Center Road because it wasn't big enough. And so then after a period of time, uh, I started working, I was big enough to start to work on a farm, got a small tractor and we would raise uh, carrots, uh, red kidney beans, hay to support animals and uh, a few cows. So then uh, later on, um, I, I uh, had an opportunity to uh, raise some uh, dairy steers. They were uh, a bull calf from a dairy, which were not uh, too desirable, and they were uh, sold quite cheap. Uh, purchased quite a few from Barney Peters' father here, and uh, he tried to get them from uh, farmers who would take care of the animal a little bit better after it was born and then ensuring uh, us that we wouldn't have uh, the losses that some would be able to get if it was purchased at a sale or that. So then uh, it was a beacon tenderling program that came along. It would feed uh, the steers whole shell corn once they got their second teeth and uh, teramycin uh, crumbles and uh, with no hay involved in that, it was, uh, we bedded them down with sawdust. And what we accomplished there was uh, we had a uh, thousand pound animal in about 16 months. Uh, this animal was uh, limited back fat, but had uh, marbling in it for uh, tendering a meat. And we would uh, stanchion them uh, about two months prior to being slaughtered and uh, that would uh, give them an opportunity to, for the sinews to soften and uh, ensuring uh, a tender piece of meat. So we were, uh, took uh, these cut beef up to uh, Roster Public Market. We were the first ones to sell uh, T-bone steaks and, and the whole cuts up there. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the market, uh, where the enclosed shed is now, um, that used to be all open. It was a spillover shed, and that's where we uh, sold it, sold that beef. But then uh, it was such a long period of time be between paychecks and uh, the beef had dropped down, and so we uh, were, were kind of forced out of it. And then a little later on, we had an opportunity to uh, raise some feeder pigs, purchase some from Dick Huss uh, as, as little pigs. And uh, we were able to raise feeder pigs. We had an opportunity to get uh, outdated yogurt from the Danner Yogurt, yogurt uh, Dock, in which my neighbor worked for. And so uh, that uh, gave us an opportunity to save on the feed. So since then we've uh, had two stalls on the Rocha Public Market at present time, selling uh, locally grown vegetables. Uh, we one time used to raise our own sweet corn, but then uh, it we couldn't raise enough and have enough help the way we were situated. So we uh, Jim over was uh, just about getting going good in the sweet corn at that time. So we said if you take 300 dozen every week, I'll sell it to you for X number of dollars. So we made a <laughs> agreement with him and uh, and then we sold uh, that along with our uh, vegetables. Uh, we we now uh, use uh, black plastic. We have a machine that lays out the plastic in the field. Uh, we stake all our tomatoes. We grow uh, vine crops uh, on, on the black plastic. Uh, I have uh, some pitchers and uh, uh, trickle irrigation which we use underneath the black plastic. 
or uh, feeding the plants uh, during stressful times and uh, rock, uh, vine crops cannot stand too much uh, water on their leaves overnight they can get some powdery mildew and downy mildew so try to eliminate that by uh, with foliage feeding you would feed the leaves we feed feeding underneath through the uh, through the trickle irrigation uh, have a little ejector that uh, forces the water and the growers, all natural growers, uh, under through and under the uh, trickle irrigation. I can show you that uh, a little later. And and also we use a row crop cover that's a, like a netting that goes over top of the plants and uh, it protects the uh, uh, little plants from uh, ter terrific uh, wind damage. Uh, that can be very devastating to a plant and you know, it doesn't really kill it many times, but uh, by pulling it up and loosening its, its roots, uh, it stunts the plant and then uh, brings it into shock. And uh, to bring that back out of it, that offsets your growing degree days, plant has a clock of its own that it wants to grow by and uh, that can offset that and affect your your yield. Um, we're presently working with uh, Peter Brayman on the Brayman farm. We're buying, we're working with Peter on uh, scallions, onions, uh, uh, and um, celery. Uh, yeah, and uh, also the parsnips. Parsnips. Yep. And. Uh, so we're, we're able to work together, and since the commission ditch was uh, clean, uh, took away a lot of the risk for uh, Peter on the mark on the muck. The muck soil is tremendously uh, rich, and uh, he is able to grow uh, all these products uh, with uh, non-toxic chemicals. Uh, we're work, we're going to try and increase that. I'd like to uh, work with him more. I'm getting a little long in the tooth, and if it uh, I can get a little something coming my way. I can uh, maybe sell a little better and I can work it up and get it there. So uh, I would like to say just one thing about uh, farming. Uh, there's more than, than the uh, farmer himself. There's his wife and I see uh, Janice Freeman in the, in the audience here. Uh, they were in the dairy. I, I knew uh, Pete's father from a little child on. And uh, I know that you have to get up real early in the morning to have breakfast for the boys when they come in from milking the cows. And that wasn't an easy chore. Uh, that was seven days a week. And uh, we have to uh, give our wives uh, a great deal of credit for uh, doing that. And, uh, and it's an honor to be here in the room where uh, Peter's grandmother honored her. And uh, thank all of you for coming. I appreciate it. Hope that uh, I can de demonstrate a little stuff that I have with me here to kind of explain what I just glossed over here. And uh, come and see me at the Russia Public Market. <laughs> Some uh, pre-prepared questions, and uh, we'll start out with with uh, Peter here. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to start with Marty. Uh, Marty, uh, uh, could uh, you explain the, the uh, five E pods, the environment, the environmentally protective overlay districts, wetlands, floodplains, woodlands, steep slopes, and water courses? What are the challenges for farmers given environmentally sensitive areas? Well, <laughs> environmentally sensitive areas are, you know, federally protected wetlands as well as um, state protected wetlands. Um, there are other environmental issues too, but um, a lot of it is um, the state has such regulatory in federal has such regulatory um, restrictions that sometimes draining these lands could be uh, an issue. Um, I think that uh, the commission just ran into a lot of these issues and um, all these things have seemed to come about from 
DEC, which was formulated in the uh, 70s. Um, I think that um, these environmental ditches that we need to be cleaned in order for it to drain the land properly so the plants can grow and by using tile and orchards and stuff uh, if the ditch is too high you can't get the water to flow off of the land. Um, I also had talked about um, other environmentally impact things like uh, um, our spraying and stuff like that to work well regulated and things like that but we have to be licensed and um, different um, we're, we're, we're farmers and we're stewards of the land and in order for us to stay in business we need to um, make sure that the land is tillable for generations um, so when we're talking about um, taking care of the environment, I don't think anybody has more at risk than the farmer. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that you, as you look upon them and the state makes regulations a, to guide us, um, we need to all work together to solve and find a solution to those problems. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, if there are any more questions, we'll open it up later. Uh, Terry. Uh, what can we residents and the town do to support our local farmers? <laughs> Buy more horses. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think they've done a lot already. Um, you know, like with purchasing the development rights uh, from uh, some of the farm, at some of the farm land out uh, in East Penfield. Um, I know it, it uh, helped. We sold the uh, development rights on 171 acres in 2002, um, and that uh, helped us a whole bunch. You know, I mean, uh, I have two sisters, and uh, you know, my my dad. I've stayed on the farm all my life, and uh, but my parents you know, wanted to be fair to all all three of us, and. We, I, think, I don't think farmers have a lot of cash on hand. Uh, they have a lot of, you know, real estate and equipment and cattle and things. And uh, so it was kind of hard for my dad. He didn't want to take anything away from me as far as the farm goes. But yet he, he wanted to do justice to my sister. So uh, by the, the town purchasing the development rights, uh, um, it ensures that there will be some agriculture uh, in town for generations and uh, it also helped you know my head to uh, split his estate up uh, more evenly and um, you know the, the ag assessments on the farmland I think that's a great thing um, and being as close to suburbia as we are here in Penfield uh, the farmers uh, uh, I think it makes a good market uh, for like you pick and some fresh fruits and vegetables and Christmas trees and it allows us a lot of extra opportunity having the public so close by I guess uh, so I guess okay uh, Peter the question for you how do you see the future of farming in Penfield today <laughs> well, that's a tough one um, I think there'll always be certain forms of farming whether the old just farm to make a living uh, will keep going. I, I can't answer that. Like Mr. Shute said, his family kind of diversified and created a store so they could sell their own product, and there will be that, you know. And uh, But for, for some types of farming, I, I don't know. You know, like you know, grain farmers and cattle farmers, I don't, I, I don't know what it will be like. I can't predict that. <laughs> we can all help out. Um, but I think, as Terry said, with the green space being sold, I think there'll always be some form of agriculture. There's probably going to have to be. You know. And uh, now back to Dick. How has your farm changed over the years? Well, we have uh, went to uh, selling at the Rocher Public Market, and with these uh, uh, use of uh, black plastic uh, helps us tremendous. We can. Uh, control uh, 
the amount of water that the uh, plant would need, um, like for instance, like melons, if it would happen to be a wetter year when they were near harvest, uh, they get waterlogged, they lose their flavor. Uh, with the plastic, we can uh, shield that off, and then if it's a dry year, we can uh, use this uh, irrigation, trickle irrigation that we have with a as a a 15 pound regulator that we use and it just oozes out water here and we can control uh, the nourishment that we can put through here on the, on the ejector uh, along with uh, foliage feeding. Uh, all our tomatoes are on uh, five foot stakes. Uh, this helps us in uh, not having to use as many chemicals to ensure uh, the quality of, of the tomato. But what I would say on something like that is uh, with that uh, we have uh, potatoes that we raise. We're having a uh, smaller, selling in smaller quantities now. Uh, our potatoes do have some imperfections in them. They do have uh, some scab on them and they'll have uh, once in a while a wormhole in them and stuff like that. But the public has to understand that if they want limited chemicals, and we, we advertise that, uh, you have to accept a little something as long as it doesn't uh, do too much damage to the potato. I was going to bring a, a few along, but I sort of got that's what, that in the ejector I forgot to bring along. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, developed a sweet meat squash. It's, uh, it's in the Latino uh, countries, it's known as a pumpkin. Uh, it's called sweet meat. We have a, a pretty strong market for that. We use uh, growers, which is an all natural foliage feed. Uh, I know you don't hear too much of that, but some of the reasons is that uh, they can't afford to have uh, grants to people to go to colleges. so. Um, this product is not as well known uh, out in the country, but um, we display this sign at the market so that it uh, enhances the brick, which is known as a sweetness in the, in the vegetable. I do have a few pictures up here, probably best uh, if someone would just like to see those. But, uh, we've had to go to uh, growing our own seedlings. We have a room in the basement of my home. It has uh, lights similar to this, only we have grow lamps. And then we have uh, under, uh, we have uh, uh, under the uh, grow cells, uh, it's like electric blanket, and that's controlled. It uh, works on 18 uh, volts uh, for heating. We can control. Uh, the temperature of uh, the grow material which uh, for germination and uh, then we have uh, I've adapted I kind of made this for myself we have it so it can bring in fresh air uh, we can maintain the ambient temperature of the room and uh, what that does is gives us uh, the plant that we know in a timely manner that we can plant in this plastic and uh, we have a few backup, backup plants for that. So uh, we used to buy them uh, and to put in there, but then uh, we get off sequence. And uh, like I say, a plant has its own uh, time frame within it, and it keeps going whether you have it in the ground or not. And then uh, you can lose uh, production tremendously. That and with this uh, trickle irrigation on this uh, particular sweet meat squash it's it doesn't yield well but uh, vine crops have they'll send out their fruit and uh, and starting at the stem and working out and as it's uh, challenged for nourishment and such if it is challenged it'll start dropping off its youngest ones the furthest out on the vines so by using uh, the trickle irrigation and, and uh, feeding, we can sustain that uh, 
offspring out there and uh, we can ensure uh, ourselves of a more uh, profitable uh, yield from that particular uh, vine. I think that's about what I'll, all I would be able to say on that. Okay. Before I open it up to questions, uh, I'd like to thank the town for providing this uh, beautiful map. Uh, really point out all different addresses of all the uh, properties in the area. Uh, and thank uh, the town board members that are here. There's Paula Metzger, Metzler, uh, Rob Quinn, and uh, Rob Moore. Andy. Thank you for coming. Andy Moore. And, uh, Andy. Now, Andy, Andy Moore. Moore. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll open it for questions. Uh, Jake, I think you had one to start out with, or did you lose it? Yeah. Um, can I ask three questions? <laughs> One at a time. I got, I got two more for Jim, right? Yeah, no, Marty. Marty, Marty too. Okay. Yes. Yeah, these are easy for you. Okay. But, but the other question, maybe for somebody back here. Uh, Louder, please. Uh, we just finished our comprehensive master plan. I was wondering how many uh, farms are still left. I know we have, there were seven that I heard in a little town, a little while ago, but maybe there are more because of the acro and uh, all these other new farming things that come in. So that's my first question. How many farms, uh, farmers are there in Penfield today? But the question on the apples is uh, how many, I know Cornell's got a lot of stuff. How many varieties do you currently um, grow and how many did you maybe 10 years ago? And when you come to harvesting, do you usually mostly equipment or do you have hands come in? Okay. <laughs> uh, Is that fair enough? It, as far as the harvesting goes, it's still hand harvested. Um, one of the techniques that have changed is um, we no longer use bushel crates. We use uh, hydraulics and loaders, and uh, we pick in 20 bushel bins. They're easier to handle, to take in and out of storage, and to keep. Um, and uh, some of the help comes from the city, some of the help shows up uh, labor is a big issue in agriculture at the present time um, there's been I, I love going to breakfast and talking with my neighbors who think that we need to build a bigger fence down at mexico and uh, <laughs> and, and keep everybody out but I, I i point out to them that their food costs have been very stable over the few last few years and that um, we need those people in order to do these jobs that um, seem that no americans really want and the issue here is a federal issue, and it's with an eggs jobs labor bill, which is different than immigration. And I hope that if you guys all walk away from this question, you understand the importance of ag labor, and it is different than immigration that I would like. And the first question you had? Well, how many species? Oh, species of apples. Um, you know, I, I believe we grew 30 then and we grow 30 now. The difference is, is that um, my dad had antique varieties, which we still have several of, but there are, are new varieties, which I'm sure you're all aware of. I mean, through the breeding program of uh, Cornell, uh, Minnesota, Michigan State, all of the uh, main agricultural schools, Penn State, they've come up with new varieties like Honeycrisp, and everybody who has a Honeycrisp, I only wish I could grow 10 times more. <laughs> Guys have paid for their whole farms that planted Honeycrisp several years ago. Um, we have Pinata. Um, you know, the Johnna Golds are, are even developed into a red Johnna Gold, so it makes it more eye appealing. Um, varieties in America are grown, Americans buy by the looks. Europeans buy by taste. So we're trying to combine both in our apples to give something that looks good and tastes good. Um, so I believe that there is relatively the same amount of varieties. There's new ones being added, antique ones being dropped off, and um, whatever the market bears. Right now it says Honeycrisp, and so we have a lot of future plantings that are, are Honeycrisp. Um, what does that take, 10 years? How long does it take? Well, you know, a good idea in fruit used to be, you know, okay, I'll plant it now in seven years, I'll see it. And it's still that way with cherries. But fruit now, with the technology that we have growing them 
anywhere from 18 inches to four feet apart, the tree, we can bring that tree and that acreage into production in three years and maximum production probably in five or six. But if you can think of it this way, this is the way um, the Cooperative Extension teaches us old farmers. If you got 25 trees in the first year, they all bear one bushel, you got 25 bushel. Now we got a thousand trees on that same acre and they're all bearing one bushel. We have a thousand bushel by the second year. By the third year, it exponentiates. And so um, you can walk away saying, wow, they're doing really well, but I didn't tell you the cost of starting that acre also has gone from $50 to $30,000 because of the cost of the trees, the wire, and um, all of the uh, things that it takes, the new tools to plant them. But they just say that by the time we get to the sixth year, we've all bought and paid for and we're actually doing much farther ahead. So that, that answers your question, I hope. Oh, how far ahead do we order trees, Terry just asked me? You know what, that's a problem now. Uh, nurseries are, have so much demand that um, I called and ordered for 2015 and the guy told me I was too late. <laughs> so, I mean, you got a, a good idea, you got to think a long time in advance. So, um, as nurseries catch up, maybe it'll get to be less, but you no longer say, I'm going to plant that acre next year and it doesn't happen. you you got to think three, four years down the road to get your trees. How many farms in the town did that question get answered? Yeah, right. That's one I wouldn't know. I know there's one. That's ours. <laughs> Eating locally, given now the increasing price of fuel, that's going to make it uh, less profitable for Mexican farmers to ship their carrots here and so on. Uh, what can we do? What can you farmers do? How can we encourage you to uh, produce for the local market? And I'm thinking mostly not so much of hay in that to feed the horses, I, they're wonderful animals, but to feed uh, consumers because there are a lot of things at the market. Uh, there are big gaps. Now at this time of the year, there's a big gap in, in carrots, local carrots. Uh, you know, they're coming now from Mexico or Canada or California. Uh, what, what can we do to increase the amount of locally grown vegetables and fruit? Well, since I'm holding this, I'll take the first stab at it. Um, apples, you can get them any day, anytime at our place. <laughs> uh, I know carrots and them, uh, we have issues because of the southern hemisphere. Uh, in order to produce fresh fruit, you know, the southern hemisphere is now in summer. Uh, you have to compete against that. I don't know much about carrots. I'm hoping that uh, uh, Mr. Hammond down there can answer that. I don't know what storage is, but apples, as I mentioned, there's CA storage, crisp air, and um, mm -hmm. the technology keeps changing so that we should be able to keep them in, in stock year round for you. Buy local, yes, I went to a seminar a week ago from Cornell and it says $5 gasoline is your, is your, is, what, how did they put it, $5 gasoline is your lucky day. And I said, oh, how can you mean that? And he says, because you won't see the Chinese being able to push in the apples that they are the major grower in the country now and they are trying to access the U.S. markets. And with free trade, we will see them. But $5 gasoline hurts them. It, it takes their carbon footprint and just kills it. Now, everybody's aware of carbon footprints now. So if we can grow local and get it to you, and your carbon footprint goes way beyond um, what you do at home. It's by buying local, you're not having somebody use 40 gallons of diesel fuel to get it to you. And so as people expand their minds and think about this in the environment, I think you'll see more local growers um, participating in markets. I mean, look at how many markets there are, my God. There's one in Penfield this day, and one in Webster this day, and one in Fairport this day. There is opportunities for you. But, well, actually, the Brighton South Wedge Market is offering a market in the winter. 
Yeah. Um, so I think you'll see these initiatives expanded. I hope you'll take advantage of them. Um, I'm not sure about the quality if we can compete with the southern hemisphere in vegetables at this time. I'll pass it on to Terry. I think most of the farmers that are left in Penfield, you know, like ourselves that used to be just uh, hay and corn and soybeans and stuff like that, are um, also, you know, trying to take advantage of the, you know, the large number of people that are so handy. Um, we just planted some strawberries and um, last year, so we'll have strawberries this year and uh, uh, pumpkins and uh, you know, like Peter's growing some celery and uh, parsnips and uh, Dave Woodward, um, he has Christmas trees and uh, raspberries. raspberries and Jim Wilbert has blueberries and raspberries and sweet corn, obviously. And uh, so I think uh, Vic, he has a lot of vegetables, but I think everybody uh, is kind of leaning towards, uh, you know, trying to have something that the public can, town can use. Land. I don't know if you guys, uh, I know Dave and Jim Wilbert couldn't be here today, but they lease land in various parts of Penfield too. And then, so there's Dave and Jim, and then there's a dairy farmer. Jerry, were you tell me like, Almost to the Wayne County border. Yeah, Bill Moore. Bill Moore. He's on. Uh, so those are the ones that that I. Tony Line Road. Yeah, I could probably answer just a little bit about the number of farms. I think it depends upon um, what your definition of a farmer is, and we have very modest gentlemen up here. And I'm going to take the opportunity right now, just briefly, to tell you what they do for our town, our, our farmers. These gentlemen and others always ask, "What can we do to help? How can we help you?" They do it silently, they do it behind the scenes. We have gentlemen who come to our watershed management committee meetings, um, which I represent the town board on. Um, we couldn't do the work we do in our town without them. We could not um, effectively drain a clean commission ditch without the input, without um, Mr. Hammond walking miles and miles uh, with our town staff to show uh, what needed to be clean. So they depend upon your definition of what a farmer is. Uh, we have a community victory garden on Five Mile Line Road. There are farmers there too. There are Girl Scouts, there are families. Terry was uh, kind enough to till the, the garden for us. And certainly our farmers have been very, very um, um, welcoming and open to give suggestions to people who are looking to grow their own. So we've got lots of different types of farming going on in our town um, that's all aided by our our longtime farmers helping us out. And I just want to insert um, our appreciation for what these farmers do day in and day out. They're at the town hall a lot. They give me a lot of input um, that we can take back to our staff. Um, a whole chunk of our town, there's history and there's an agricultural heritage that aids us in what we do every day. So if that helps answer that, we don't, I don't think we can put a number on how many people are farming in our town. In time. I, could, I do want to. It could be growing. Yeah. Right. I do want to That's mention too, Jim Bauman. He was going to be here today, and, and he certainly has a big farm on um, uh, Five Mile Line and Plank. Who's that hydroponic? The fresh wine. The hydroponic farm. Yeah. Yeah. Pepfield Center Road. Right. Yeah. That's not Jim. So. No, Question? that's not Jim. So, I'm Susan Four, and I'm speaking right now as a member of the town's Energy and Environmental Conservation Board. Um, we've we've talked in our a group about how to support the farmers and we're going to try with Phil Seely and myself we're going to try to put together the information there is a wealth of farmers farm markets local produce Penfield grown and we think this fits into um, environmental protection we think it fits into the town's wellness we're going to try to put this together put this information on the web put this together with like a trifold so that you can have a, a piece of paper that says strawberries. Oh, go see Terry's office. <laughs> Christmas trees. Go see Dave Woodward. This kind of information, and, and there's a wealth of others, as small stands as well as uh, the big farms. And we're going to try to put this together and get it out to our residents. Like I say, we hope. Um, <laughs> Phil Steele and I are are tasked with that. Kirk Miller, uh, given the climatic changes that we're facing 
and uh, the shortages of oil that we're facing and other energy sources, do you see this negatively affecting what you can do in your businesses? And also, do you see a growth in the value of your business as a result of these factors? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Well, oil's going to affect us all. I mean, whether it's your heating or your budgets or whatever it is, but oil is definitely on the rise. It'll affect us at tilling. Uh, we use a lot of fuel um, in our tractors. They're not really energy efficient. Um, so from that standpoint, um, I, I would guess it would um, affect everybody in this room. Plus, it'll show up on your dinner table. How many people have seen the cost of food rising in the last few months? And I, I gotta say, um, a lot has to do with grains. They're using it for fuel, as you know, corn. So when you take corn off the market, 30% of the corn now goes to <coughs> ethanol. You take 30% of the corn off the market, they don't have it to feed their cows. So they gotta compete and pay more for that corn to feed their cows. Um, I think you're seeing a shortage in Siberia of wheat this year. Um, when I was in school, they, we helped to develop a, a shorter stock of wheat so they could grow it. But um, they had a failure, and I think that that's putting pressure on the wheat markets. So yes, I, I, I do see, and I think we're all going to share in the pain together. I, I think it's going to come. But Go ahead. Can Penfield, uh, first of all, are the negative climactic changes going to affect us here? as much as other places in the world mm -hmm. and if not will you be able to make more money by being able to provide food at higher prices I'm going to give this to somebody else <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we will we'll, we'll capitalize on it because of fuel costs going up I think people will buy local I think the opportunity, you look in Penfield, um, you have this young kid, Nate, uh, who has a little stand. He's a, he's a new farmer. He, he took the initiative to develop it himself. He uh, works for Jimmy Bowman part-time. So I think you see a lot of, um, he sees the retailing as a way to sell his vegetables. And he's there because he's making money. So I, I do think that, um, yes, in Penfield, you, you will see more stands more people trying to sell they can't sell to the processor anymore because processor you'll never get rich so you're going to have to break out and retail and competition is good it's good for all of us I always said my dad said it makes us do a better job and that's true it'll make us do a better job and it'll work for you because it'll keep prices down Jenny? To, to, to backtrack uh, uh, to Commission Ditch I, I have walked along there many many times and I would like a little more history on it where does it begin and where does it end and uh, 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 and how, how how when was it start I'm just interested well it start it starts on Dick, Dick Hammond's farm oh okay uh, which is on Penfield Center Road right and it flows kind of north for just a short ways and then juts around and makes a circle and flows directly south Crosses Penfield Center Road, Route 250, or uh, Atlantic Avenue, not 250. Sweets Corners Road, still continuing south, and then it makes a 90 a 90 degree bend and heads east and crosses Harris Road down by the the stables, oh, right. and then uh, continues east for a ways and makes another 90 degree bend and uh, goes oh, yeah. directly south again and crosses Route 441 just before you come down to Salt Road, right. where the stoplight is on Salt Road, it continues south into the town of Parrington. It will, oh, but you see, it, it goes right through Veterans Park, the, the, the uh, park at the town hall? No. I, I, no, not no, the town no. hall. The, uh, no, it doesn't, it sure. doesn't. Sherwood. You're talking Sherwood, Sherwood Park right. down on Penfield Road? Right. Or? Yeah. But it, it's, it, and it was put there specifically to drain the, the wetland? Well, it drained the whole uh, east side of Penfield, the, the whole east, water, east watershed of Penfield. And that's the whole purpose of it? Well, to, it was dug for to drain the east side of Penfield for the farming and to be able to make roads. And where does it drain into other than? It, it drains into Thomas Creek, which is in Fairport. Oh, okay. And, 
I flows know into a Rodney Coy right. Creek and I goes know. right back to the bay. Oh my gosh, I just have wondered about that. What, having walked beside it so often, yeah. wondered where it came from mm -hmm. and how. The Commission Ditch, how did it get that name? Uh, I'm not really sure. They, they started it in 1900. Do you know the name? Oh, it's always uh, years back, I was told that uh, each uh, commissioner of the town would like to have something that he could brag about, so uh, he would use uh, the commission ditch with his name on it, and uh, so then as, as time went on, they said, well, wait a minute, we gotta, we'll just call this the commission ditch, not any name behind that, and uh, I would like to say in regards to the commission ditch, uh, Peter's grandfather was very instrumental in uh, getting the ditch dug the second time and getting it cleaned along with Terry's father and uh, other others, uh, Howard Frank. Uh, we have letters that uh, Peter's grandfather sent to uh, Governor Carey for assistance to uh, help uh, get this uh, clean, and I believe uh, that was the starting of uh, the off-road drainage tax of which you see. Uh, that's a little bit of a concern to some of us because the ponds now uh, come under that and uh, we'll have to kind of massage that thought a little bit going forward. We have some thoughts on it. I think that's about it. <laughs> the commission ditch when it first was dug was actually called the Beacon Ditch. Now, I don't know when they changed it right at the start, but it was originally called the Beacon Ditch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> DPW. <laughs> Marty, you mentioned about um, your, the farm equipment industry isn't very um, efficient yet. Are, are there make, is, is there any progress being made in having the farm equipment industry become more efficient for farmers? They're becoming more efficient, but it's just that when you're pulling a plow or, or any equipment, <laughs> and when you're pulling a plow or any equipment, when you're, you know, anybody knows from physics, energy, the more energy you put into it, the more you're going to have to use. So um, they, they are becoming more efficient. But you're not going to see an electric tractor, and you're not going to see an electric <laughs> tractor trailer truck. Um, it just isn't in the cards and technology at the time. In order to, um, to get the power, you, you, we still have to burn diesel. And uh, the good news is, is that diesel is now a, um, a non-sulfur product, so it doesn't emit those small particles. So um, that's one way technology has changed and uh, made it safer for the air you breathe. Can you talk a little bit about pesticide use? What, if, what are you up against with that? <laughs> I hate talking about pesticides <laughs> because all at once everybody puts a skull and a crossbones on you and no. does it. Um, uh, but in pesticides is inevitable in this part of the country to use on fruits and vegetables. And I can speak from fruits mostly. Everybody says, oh my gosh, you know what I mean? Can't you do something about that bug? Bug is not the problem. Okay? It's fungus. Then this part of the world, New York, Penfield, we have humidity and temperature, and when they cross, fungus grows. Um, our spray schedules are set up by these charts. There's not much we can do about that except come up with safer and shorter half-lifes of chemicals. The bug thing is pretty easy. Um, we have an IPM program, which is Integrated Pest Management. We hire an expert in the field. He comes out and he measures thresholds of bugs in these traps. And with those traps, we only spray when he says we hit five mites per leaf. Or we no longer come in and spray with an organic phosphates that wipe out everything. Those days are gone in the 60s. The spray materials used today are biodegradable by sunlight. Um, they don't have the heavy metals in them anymore, or the mercury compounds. Um, you can pretty much take an apple from our stand and eat it. I still say wash it off, but you're going to be more problems with environmental things like birds flying overhead on your apple. That would be more of a trouble, to, and that's a good reason to wash it. But uh, pesticides <laughs> really aren't, aren't an issue. Um, by the time we quit spraying, 
the second week in August, by the time we start picking later variety apples, a month has passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been a lot of rainwater and sunlight and, and those things. So from the standpoint of um, pesticides, um, I, don't, I don't think you have anything to worry. We're getting better, we're using less. Mm -hmm. We use half the amount my father did. Mm -hmm. They're much safer to use. Um, they're, they're okay for the environment. And um, I'm trying to think of it. Like there was a something. How about relative to bees? Okay, bees. We, we have 50 hives on our farm. Colony collapse disease is very important to all of us farmers. With colony collapse disease, they thought it was pesticides. Now they're not sure. Um, they're still doing a lot of, ish, a lot of uh, research down at Penn State. Um, so far, from talking to beekeepers, one of the biggest problems they're trying to decide now is the movement of bees by moving them to Florida to pollinate in uh, Maine for the blueberry crop and, and then back to Penfield. They're finding that that might have something to do with disorienting them, um, more so than pesticides. But nobody's really sure about colony collapse disease. I know we have 50 hives on our farm. They're doing the best they've ever done this year. Um, and um, they're very much needed in our in any production of any agricultural item. You were commenting on contemporary methodology with black plastic and triple, triple uh, irrigation. It, does that reduce the, um, the fungicide issue for vegetables? It helps in that uh, regard as, uh, quite a bit. Uh, on the vine crops, it's not as uh, effective, but uh, on uh, the tomatoes especially, uh, we feel it's uh, a, a good thing. Um, a healthy plant can withstand some uh, pressures from uh, some bugs and that, and you can get get away with some things like that. Um, having them staked is uh, probably one of the biggest things. And then using the right variety, which would have abundance of leaves is what you would need to protect the tomato itself from sun scalding. Is that kind of... I would like to comment, since I have this, uh, mention about the markets. Uh, I go to different meetings also, and uh, our state is promoting markets in uh, many of the smaller towns and communities. Uh, they assist uh, people in starting these new markets, uh, specifically for what the gentleman asked about uh, traveling and uh, cut down on the use of uh, fuel for for that purpose. So your, your state is working with farmers uh, to try and get uh, weekly markets like the Lima and different in Canandaigua and different markets like that there. Uh, I happen to go to the Roger Public Market. It's the world's favorite market was voted this year. Uh, they are trying to do what they can to uh, work with parking. Uh, they have now have a, a, trail, uh, a little bus that takes you around. They have 600 uh, car parking on the uh, north side of the Union Street there. Uh, constantly going to be working towards that. But then there's many people that come, especially on a Thursday, who like to use the market as an uh, exercising uh, tool along with uh, saving money and uh, purchasing of, of the vegetables that uh, they would need for the week. The other thing I see coming up, uh, which I'm going to push hard this year, is uh, canning. I think that uh, something that was has been lost in the community, I see a few heads nodding, nod, nodding here, uh, I think you can uh, benefit tremendously by, and I'll say tomatoes especially, uh, So because there's so many things you can do with tomatoes and use them over a period of time in the can. Uh, so I'm going to, hopefully I'm going to be uh, increasing my tomatoes, maybe drop off on a couple of them. <coughs> in regards to the carrots, uh, I have tried to overwinter carrots in the soil, which is uh, a great thing because uh, as time goes on, 
defrost and that enhances the sweetness and of the carrot. The problem we have is we're so close to the thousand acre swamp that uh, unless they're covered by a screen, they all find them every time and I tried it two years in a row and I, I know I, I got it now. Uh, I, I got some chain link fence. I don't know if I'm going to be able to <laughs> delay it over it or not. But, uh, but I did want to comment on what your state is doing to try and uh, create these markets. The other thing is uh, I don't like to throw stones at uh, China, mainly because I can't reach them. But <laughs> the big thing is uh, there are, people are always after us as to, you know, what are you using to feed the plants? But yet over there, uh, and I'll give you an example of, uh, of garlic. Garlic, you go to Russia Public Market, it's just about right now, as well you can find is a, a Chinese grilled garlic that has, for, all, for people that really use garlic, know that the flavor is not there. So we're, uh, we're trying to <coughs> get into that a little bit. Um, working with Pete here, we have, uh, in order to get the garlic planted, you have to go really, really slow if you're going to be riding a tool to place the ball in the upward position. So the lettuce or the celery planter, which uh, we've talked with Pete about, uh, can be used for that and a couple other uh, uses for uh, curly leaf mustard and, and that uh, on the farm. So we're going to try and work on that there. I think as far as the price of vegetables go, if you if you realize that what you're getting so fresh and uh, that I I think that it's worth it to you if you have to pay just a little bit more uh, labor is like Marty says is a tremendous problem uh, well that's a tremendous problem you can hire people but and just as a little story I hired these two boys to harvest some broccoli for, for me. And uh, many of you have seen the loose belts on many of the boys, and you can imagine what that done. Uh, one boy was harvesting heads, and the other one, and they were side, and uh, this one boy would harvest a head, pull up his pants, go to the next one. So I went up to him and I said, listen, uh, I like what you're doing, but you're just a little short. Kevin here, uh, I'm going to only be able to pay you half. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, by the time you're pulling up your pants, you could cut another head of broccoli for me. And uh, just like to have you know that I got some string in the car here, or truck. Uh, let's try that. Thank you. John, you had a question? We, uh, in two, uh, the town in 2002, I think, we had a, a bill passed, or we had a, uh, we bought, or we, we, uh, we passed a, a conservation easement of, of $10 million for this town. And that, that included several of the, many of the, the farms in, in, in uh, Penfield. And it kept, it kept them in farms, just like uh, uh, Terry mentioned to him and his family. And this allows us to, or allows the farmers to continue to, to still operate, or many of the farms can still operate in Penfield. And I don't think many people realize that, that we had, we spent $10 million on that not too long ago. Yes. Thank you. So you have another question? Yeah. Uh, for Marty. Shoot. I'm sorry again. Um, <laughs> there's a proposal underway for a fairly large housing development in the corner of Shoecraft and Plank, um, Berry Turkey Farm. Oh, that's on Jackson Plank. Jackson Plank. Sorry. Okay. And, uh, along with it a sewer extension which I I'm just going to jump to conclusions and say it's going to increase development pressure would you would you talk a little bit of, since right in your front yard there um, about development pressure and agriculture sure let me say thank you to the town <laughs> and I'll tell you why because you purchased our development rights back in 2002 also with Terry's and without it there would be no shoots anymore um, the land was so valuable and there were sewers already on the back side of our farm that my dad said to me, what do you think? And I said, I think you're crazy. I can't pay that kind of money for that farm. 
I said, I'll just take my chances. He bought, sold the development rights, which was a very fair offer from both sides, and he sold me the farm. And for that, I think our farm will stay around for another generation. As far as the uh, development pressure, that eased it from us. We, we're no longer in the uh, thoughts of it. I realized Jimmy Bowman and us, I think, are the two closest farms to uh, Rochester. <laughs> Um, and I, I like having the idea that it'll stay there forever, to be honest with you. Um, pressure coming down, I think it's everywhere. Um, I think that when you dangle those big numbers in front of farmers and the low income that they've been getting for the last few years, if they haven't figured out you know, how to retail it or something, um, I, I don't know how they could say no. Um, berries, I have been a turkey farm for a long time. I mean, we'll all miss them in the town. But I don't think there's any of his kids to pass it down to. Um, maybe somebody else on this board can talk about uh, pressure from, um, but uh, we're out of the equation. I know the stump farm has got five lots on it. There, There's not going to be a lot of development there. Um, development pressure, too, from an agricultural standpoint, we're protected under the Ag Assessments and uh, the Right to Farm Act and stuff. And, and so as long as we're doing it uh, responsibly, um, I try and work it out with my neighbors. I had one lady come. She probably owned a very expensive house behind us. And she calls me, and she'd moved in there. And the sprayer went down the row. And she goes, what is that? And I said, well, it's a sprayer. Well, you can't do that here. And I said, well, we have to. We can't not do it here. But I'll tell you what. I said, I understand what, how you feel about this. Let's try and come to a compromise. And I called her. Every day we were going to spray. And I tried to make it so that we weren't doing it early or late when we did that section of the farm. So you can work, but there are going to be challenges as development comes. But we need to work together instead of being a farmer that says, I'll fix them. I'll park my manure wagon right down there in the back. You know, which I have seen done. And, and I know several people, but, but it's the wrong approach. Town's going to expand. And uh, there's room for all of us to live together. And I, I, I think, I hope that answers your question. I just had a question about uh, your families and bringing the, you know, your next generation into your farming business. Is that something that is appealing to young people right now? Or is it, are your kids looking at new ideas and, you know, those families that have the big land, the big pots of land, are there new things that they're being, you know, just sort of floated around in terms of how to keep going? I, I guess in our family I have four children. Uh, two boys and two girls, and uh, uh, none of them are, uh, you know, working on the farm with me. Uh, our younger son, Scott, uh, he works for Morgan Services. Uh, they have a bunch of trailer parks and stuff, and uh, he, he met, says he misses being around home, you know, and uh, so I guess there, there's always an, a possibility there, and uh, my two daughters, uh, they kind of like the uh, strawberry stuff and uh, the you pick and uh, the, all four of them. Uh, last year we planted pumpkins and all four of them were really into that. My daughter, older daughter, she's a phys ed teacher at uh, Pittsburgh Menden High School and she wanted to do a fundraiser with the pumpkins and uh, I thought, well, that was seems like too far for people from Pittsburgh to come all the way over on Salt Road and buy a pumpkin. Uh, and uh, one Saturday afternoon she had a fundraiser where the, the Pittsburgh girls lacrosse team uh, took half the money and we took half the money and uh, she ended up taking in $700, um, you know, that one Saturday afternoon from one to four. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the, being as close to uh, the public as we are. Um, I, I guess I could see some of the our children 
carrying on a little to use the land, I guess, you know, they've always had the privilege of that extra space around them and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I could see them doing something just to keep the land work. But um, then a couple other things uh, too, uh, you know, Marty was saying, you know, a third of the corn is going to ethanol um, and everybody thinks that the, the feed's wasted, but uh, after they take the ethanol out, they still um, dry down the corn and uh, use it for, for cow feed. So I, I don't see that that's a big, uh, uh, I don't feel like it's taking a lot of feed away from animals to take the ethanol out. And um, it sure helped make the, the corn prices up where it's more profitable uh, to grow corn anymore. Um, and some other things that uh, some of the corn companies have, have gone to, most of the seed companies now for that uh, produce uh, corn seed and soybeans and cotton. Um, they've been genetically modifying some of the seeds and some of the, the traits that they've got uh, available now is corn and soybeans and cotton that's Roundup ready. Um, I think everyone knows what Roundup is and how safe it is. You can send your uh, grandchildren into uh, Home Depot and, and buy a gallon of Roundup, um, and they've, they've got corn and soybeans that uh, is resistant to that, so that's all you need to keep the weeds under control. And they've got uh, corn that's uh, um, corn borer resistant and uh, also rootworm resistant, you know, so that uh, eliminates a lot of uh, pesticides uh, to, to grow a healthy crop of corn. And, uh, you know, relieving some of the stresses like that on corn is uh, the uh, yields in the past 40 years are up from say uh, 80 to 100 bushel to 180 bushel per acre. As a consumer I appreciate all you're doing for the environment and to make our apples look pretty and all, but as a person of faith I really have a concern about our farm workers not having any workers rights right now. So in good conscience I find it very hard uh, to purchase when I go to Wegmans and uh, onions from sodas, knowing that laborers pick those fruits and vegetables for us. I, I would love to be able to do that, but honestly, in good conscience, I know the farm worker bill just failed after many years of people trying to get something, some equal rights for the farm uh, workers. And so right now, my thing is, where do I buy fruits and vegetables where farm, uh, for, uh, farm workers do not pick them? Aside from all that, I just wanted you to know as a consumer here in Rochester, New York, that that's where I'm coming from. You know, and you can say all you want about where you stand and all, but uh, without any protections or guaranteed rights for our workers, many I know are undocumented, and I know what the feeling is about undocumented. Some people may feel that they don't have any rights that we shouldn't consider them. But the fact is that a lot of these workers, this has been going on for 60 years since uh, President Delano <coughs> Roosevelt, they've been excluded deliberately by Southern Democrats because they were African Americans. They've always been people of color. And my concern is why has it taken us so long to consider the rights of farm workers? Um, and um, we're talking about Americans. That, you know, I know in the last 20 or 4 years a lot of them have come from Mexico and are undocumented. Some people will justify that and uh, call them illegal and whatever. And, say, maybe feel that they deserve what they get. But the fact is, we need them, we're using them, we're making, we're enjoying fruits and vegetables off their backs. So I, I, I'm just bringing that to all of you. So. I am a member of the Farm Bureau. It's an organization which helps us to move forward politically. Um, if you were to ask any of those undocumented workers, I say, let's document them. I also say that if you were to find a bad apple in the barrel and you would, you would find it in any profession, those farm workers that come and do work on our farm are paid a fair wage, much above minimum wage. They also are, there's, in the community here, there are outreach medical centers that are just for them. There is opportunity for them for child care. As far as working seven days a week and not getting overtime, they choose to work 
if you mandate them a day of rest, which is what is in the farm worker bill, they will choose not to use, not to take it. They work such a short season that they want to work all they can to support their family. They take home more here than they do in Mexico. And they go back to Mexico after their stint in a seasonal job here and live fairly well because of the standard of living. And if you think that you're buying anything in the grocery store that isn't handpicked, I would think that um, in America they have the most, um, most of their um, rights. I, I realize what you're saying is that they don't get the overtime, but they, they don't want that. They want to be able to make as much as they can in that short season. It's a window. And they have to go back. If they speak out against abuse, any of that, are they protected? Your, your son and daughter should work in the pizza parlor have more rights than they do. And they're exploited because they are undocumented. Where do they go? Uh, what, well, what options do they have? They, there's, there is options. There's a lawyer service here in town, in Brockport, that supports them and can get them. I tell you, documentation is a big problem. I mean, I would like to see them documented because all we have to do is track them. Um, and I would like to see them have the same rights. But farm workers, uh, as far as being abused, 99% of them are not abused. They are, um, we do not house any, but the people that I do know build very nice camps. It's usually for the male, and he's only working seven or eight. A young couple with a three-month-old baby and a three-year-old were forced out of their, they couldn't pay their rent, uh, forced out of their trailer and they couldn't pay, they didn't have a job, okay? So the farmer uh, turned down their heat and with electricity and they were forced to find help from We Who Are Advocates. Not here in Hennepin. No, it's uh, west of, in the west, big farm. Okay. I won't mention the name, but it's a big farm. Uh, that's an important distinction, though. I, yeah. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of, there, there's probably, maybe there's cases like that, but I think most of the farmers that, that uh, have, uh, say Mexicans help and they admire them to pieces. I know in Wyoming County my uh, cousin and her husband have a big dairy farm and up there the uh, uh, you know they, uh, the, the police officers kind of you know watch Board for them and, and like I know the farmers and the Farm Bureau will you know go to court you know to uh, help represent the, the helpers that they got, you know. Um, so I, I think the, the farmers appreciate the Mexicans uh, tremendously, and I think for the fruit and vegetables, don't they get paid piece worth? Yeah, and it's much more than minimum wage or anything. Well, we're going we're gonna to call this meeting. I think it's getting a little bit of the politics. Um, I'd like to thank our guests, Dick, Peter, Terry, and Marty. Thank you for coming. Uh, we will place a brick in the honor of the Penfield Farmers at the Daniel Penfield stage. And thank you. Uh, please come up and take a look at the back if you have any questions.